any of you know a nearby woman's clothing store that is offering bright clothing for 75% off, <laughs> do not tell Ann Turner, because she is absolutely certain to be there. Uh, and, and there go the life savings of the Turnbull family. <laughs> you will see what I mean in a few moments. Look, all I have to say is this. She is an absolutely fabulous mother of three children. She is a superb scholar. She uh, takes her scholarship down, and we live in a little village in North Carolina, and she's working diligently and daily with two families whose children are in transition from school to adult life. So she is on the ground. She has been an expert witness in three cases in North Carolina for the families. Now all the cases are being settled. So she's done a whale of a job there. <laughs> and today is her birthday, so I want you all to say on three. One, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Annie. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let me give you the award. Oh, well, lovely. Oh, beautiful. So here is they. Oh, in honor of Jay. I love it. That's oh, oh, lovely bookends. And Rudd, we have so many books falling. Thank you, Anita. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rudd. Thank you, Melanie, and all of the people from Cadre. Noella and Diana have been so fabulous from the very first that we started talking about this. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Now, I have to tell you about my birthday. Um, I'm 70 years old today, and that is really old. But it always makes me feel better when I have a zero birthday because Rudd has a zero birthday a month before mine and he's 10 years older. So Rudd was 80 in September and now I'm 70. So we have been laughing this fall that we are 150 years old. <laughs> And then when we laughed, well, let me, then a good friend, a dear friend, gave me this shirt for my birthday, and it says, celebrating our Setswa Centennial. I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really know that word. It sounds like a word that would be in an OSEP Center title, doesn't it? <laughs> celebrating our Setswa Centennial birthday and a picture of Rudd and me and our family. How's this? What do you think? And so I said to Rudd, I, I will be, you be 120 and I'll be 30. So I know it's not typical for people to give their keynote presentations in shirts like this, but because it's my 70th birthday, I'm going to do it. <laughs> what a pleasure it is to be with you and to have a chance to talk about win-win-win partnerships with families. Now, Rudd mentioned that I have been involved since we retired to North Carolina uh, as an expert witness. And a case that I'm working with now involves 20 children who were either denied admission or expelled from a preschool because they had various types of special needs. Um, one of the little boys um, had uh, diabetes, 
and his family bought a house across the street from the preschool so that they could go over each morning and check his blood level and make sure he was okay because they didn't want to cause any imposition on the school. So many families feel that way. Uh, so the, the parents would do that. The father arranged to have a job working at home so he would always be available, as well as the little boy's mom. They would go over and finally the, the preschool director told them that it was just too intrusive for them to come and that their son would no longer be able to be in the preschool. Living across the street, he ended up sitting on the porch watching his friends come to school each morning, but he couldn't go across the street to the preschool because he had diabetes. Now, what is, what's happened? This is 2017, how could this be? Uh, other children had um, allergies, um, had um, a, a speech delay, an auditory processing disorder. One of the 20 that really got me was a little boy who had been there, but who had to have a leg amputated because of a birth um, situation that he had. Had his leg amputated, got a prosthetic leg, was working with the physical therapist, was ready to come back to school, but he had not yet learned to go up and down the steps with his prosthetic leg, but that was going to be in the next six months of his mobility uh, training. And the director said he could not come back to the preschool um, because he couldn't go up the steps. And the parents said, but there's an elevator. And, and, and the director said, but, but only teachers can use the elevator. So. So what, what, what do we need to do in 2017? Yes, this is an outlier situation. It's not typical, but it's happening. It's happening, and these little kids are just three and four and five years old. And I think about having raised our son to the age of 41 when he passed away, of how much is ahead of them and how it's not necessary to struggle this hard at the early childhood level. Um, this morning, Ruth gave a very interesting presentation on the centers, and Rudd and I had a chance to work with the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center that's at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, on four webinars this um, past year on family engagement. And um, the, this presentation, the PowerPoint is online and the links are live and you can go if any of you would be interested in thinking about using any of these webinars in professional development or for families. Um, and in the webinar series, we went through a number of frameworks that have been developed related to partnerships. The Department of Education has a framework on family school partnerships at the early childhood level. Head Start has a framework. The Division for Early Childhood has recommended practices. Um, IDEA is what the, the IDEA requirements are what has really characterized family engagement and special education in terms of participating in evaluations and IEPs and giving consent and the dispute resolution issues. And then within general education, Joyce Epstein's framework for parent involvement has been the most prevalent. But all of these, these frameworks are like these bricks in a yard spread across that are not kind of pulled together to build, to, to build a strong building, uh, they need integration. And so part of the work that Rudd and I did with the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center, OSEP funded, thank you OSEP, um, was to go through all of these frameworks and to look for the bottom line. What do these frameworks have in common? And it was so interesting that from that analysis, we found that basically, the key word that was in all of these frameworks was trusting partnership. That was the one similarity across every framework. And then uh, from the trusting partnerships, we put together this framework 
that I want to just highlight for you and hope that those of you from states will consider thinking about how this framework could be systematized at the state level and at the local level, and the same thing for parent training and information centers. One of the, the things that has concerned me as a person who's lived both in the family world and in the professional world is that the family training through parent training centers, through community parent resource centers, th there is a way that that training is done. And then there's a, tra a way that training is done in universities in the family course. And there's a way training is done on families and school districts, and none of these ways are aligned. And if my vision for my 90th birthday, or maybe 80th birthday, would be that we could agree on a common framework, that I would hope we could take this one and tweak it in any way people feel like it needs to be tweaked. I don't want to impose it on people. But if we had a common framework across all of our different technical assistance avenues on family partnerships and everyone was talking the same language. And what I want to envision with you is if, fa if families knew the behaviors to reach out to professionals and be partners, and if professionals knew the behaviors to reach out to families and be partners, and we're talking the same language, what synergy we could build by being on the same page. And so that's what I get excited with. And with this framework, and isn't it kind of energizing for it to be a sunshine framework? You know, it, uh, it, it's the, the light and the, and the energy. And uh, on the inside of the sunshine is the trusting partnerships. Clap if you like the sunshine. <laughs> yes. And think if we can all get on the same page, families and professionals and students, you know, what power we can generate. So first I'm going to talk about that inner circle and that's going to be the principles of partnership. And the first principle is communication. And this can be the communication of how educators communicate with families and how families communicate with educators. These indicators apply to both people in the partnership. Um, and just in um, these principles we generated from 33 focus groups. Do you know how long it took us to conduct 33 focus groups? And we did that across three states. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is so many people in our focus groups were from culturally diverse backgrounds because almost all the family research is done on white mothers, middle, upper middle class mothers. You know, and I was, and the way that we were able to be so diverse is because we partnered with OSEP's Community Parent Resource Center in New Orleans and the amazing leaders of Ursula and DJ Marquis. And Ursula um, and DJ from their civil rights background and their African American leadership, Ursula was such a wise woman and right to the point. And she said, Ann, if you and Rudd come down here, and you, you know, we will, our families know they can trust you because we trust you. But if you do the focus groups, they're not going to open up to you the same way that they would open up if you weren't in the room. And some of them, she said, have never trusted a white person before, so why should they trust you from the University of Kansas? To, and she said, I tell you what, you train us to be focus group facilitators and we'll get you the real skinny from what families say. And that's how this work became so rich. It's because we listened to our cultural navigators and partnered with them in trust. One of the first things Ursula said when we told her we wanted to partner as we were getting to know her, she said, you just want to drop by for a touch of color, don't you? She said, that's what all the researchers do. We said, no, Ursula, 
we're going to be here through the end of time. And I kissed her in her coffin and told her to save a place for me in heaven. And that's how long we were together through the end of time. So with this, that background, this research, these communication indicators, and for each one, I'm just going to highlight one of the particular indicators, the listening and empathizing is so critically important. The inside empathy of understanding what it's like to be in somebody's shoes, but the outside empathy of telling people you, you get it and that you understand and you're with them. Um, and um, there is training that I and some colleagues developed in Kansas for Kansas Part C modules a wonderful consultant for that was Janice Fialka. Some of you may have heard her speak at conferences. She's from Michigan and wonderful. And they're, they're wonderful gold nuggets in these modules that are kind of buried in the Kansas part. See, there's also some parts that are not so good. But maybe part of the cadre proposal could be to take the gold nuggets and use them you know, how can we capitalize on the investment of teaching practitioners to communicate in empathetic ways? There's a lot there that can be brought to greater polish. I was glad to see the conference session on the life cycle of empathy. Uh, competence is a second um, principle of partnership. <laughs> implementing research-based practices. You know, in IDEA, between the statute and the regulations, how many times do you think research is mentioned? How many people think 10 times? If you think at least 10 times? At least 20 times? Over 200 times. The word research is in the IDEA statute. What we are supposed, and regulations, what we are supposed to be doing in all of our practices is documenting the research base. And when we are, parents are in IEP conferences, they need to have access to research based practices. Right now, and we were just talking with Tina from OSEP about this, there is such a need for a translation of research for the benefit of families and research for the benefit of teachers. So many general ed teachers have no clue of what the research-based practices are. And um, we, I, uh, recently, Rudd and I were doing some training with people who wanted to know research on inclusion. And they are people who work for the, in international arenas, in, developing countries and they're required now to serve people with disabilities. They don't have a clue about the research. And so we, we sent out an email to about 25 of the top researchers on inclusion and said, can you send us a summary? Can you send us a, an annotated bibliography? Can you send us the New York Times book review of family re of inclusion research? And nobody had it. We have this, these vast number of journals, but we, it's like trying to get a sip of water from a fire hydrant. We have a fire hydrant of research, and it's so difficult for anyone to get a drink of water. Do you, is that your experience? How do due process hearing officers know research-based research? How do attorneys, how do mediators know what IDEA requires. We've got to do a better job of translating this. And then here is the Andrew language. And um, the, the wonderful, the, the bullet to me of the whole Andrew case is that there must be documentation of the student's potential for progress. I don't know if the field of special education really knows how to measure potential for progress, but we need to make our best effort because that is what underlies appropriately ambitious um, programs if you have the potential for progress correct. There is so much new research to be done and so much research to be collected. And what I just hope doesn't happen for all of you who work in states 
is that I hope your approach to Andrew is not, what can we do to keep the schools out of trouble? If you think that, or if you hear that, please be guilty. Because the opportunity is to take the education of students with disabilities to the next level. From the benefit, getting a benefit from the Rowley case to having a, an appropriately ambitious program to get appropriate progress. We go from benefit to progress. Don't protect, don't think how do we cover ourselves. Think how do we partner with families to grow through the injury case. Rudd and I had a wonderful opportunity about a month ago to meet Andrew and his wonderful parents and his little brother. And that family has worked for eight years for this case. Andrew is now 18. He's facing transition. And they're still trying to settle fourth grade. We owe it to them and to him to make the most of making our programs more ambitious and more challenging for all of the Andrews of the world. So next, the third principle of partnerships is respect. Building on the child's strengths, valuing the family's perspectives, and I love this honoring cultural diversity. So important. Families from diverse backgrounds are less satisfied with the IEP process, typically attend less frequently, and often feel that they are the targets of implicit bias, and they are. My dear friend Sherilyn, who you'll see on a video in a few minutes, African American, talks about going into the principal's office for her daughter Deja, and the principal just ignoring her, you know, and just not looking up. And after she was there eight or 10 minutes and really feeling marginalized, a white mom came in and the principal immediately looked up and said, well, hello, Mrs. So-and-so, what can I do for you? And Sherilyn said she just walked out. We must, in our partnerships, address implicit bias and, and, address and honor diversity and be respectful and treat everyone with dignity. I want to play just a short um, video clip. And uh, this is from an OSEP funded center, a community parent resource center in Brooklyn. Our dear friend uh, Lourdes Poots. In your work, you try to meet families' needs. What are those basic needs? What are the greatest needs that those families have? Okay, so for the most, uh, I would say the greater percentage of the families that call us often have issues around housing. Um, immigration is really big in this community. And then access. And, and access is a problem, is a huge problem. And it's across the systems. Um, so I, I think, right, you agree? Yeah. So that's probably the areas that are, are most prevalent to them. Oftentimes, some of us might think that those housing access and other needs uh, are not really what the Department of Education works on. On the other hand, you work on those needs. They seem to me to be far more fundamental than needs having to do only with education. How do you go, with that number of families, how do you go mm -hmm. about meeting those needs for housing access? So one of the things that we discovered early on worked best for us in the area of housing was having someone on staff who for a long time worked for us and then retired and now volunteers. And she's a social worker by nature and as a professional. And what she has done is she's pretty much is very well connected to all kinds of services and she'll work with families when there are issues around housing it could and housing when i say housing doesn't necessarily always mean a shelter it, it could mean the fact that you know they're living 10 people in, in a studio apartment 
or it could mean that they have no food at home and the connection needs to be to get them to a pantry. Or it could be that um, you have a child who is a wheelchair user and lives on the third floor walk up. Right. So, and these are the, the kind of thing, what we've done is um, through the assistance of this volunteer, we'll often put letters together. Uh, she will accompany them to elected officials' offices to see how they can support the families. Um, and we found that in what's really important is that we need to address the child as a whole and not just that one particular problem in the school, because we know that everything has a domino effect. So once we're able to help them feel like they're working, because not doesn't always necessarily have immediate resolution, but if they feel like they're working towards a resolution, then it eases that area so that then they can focus on the child. And Lourdes tells us about families who need help with housing. And some of the families are living in a one bedroom apartment with a mom and six kids and a grandmother. Some of them are homeless. Many of them are afraid of being evicted. How can they go to an IEP conference and talk about goals and objectives if that's what they're dealing with? And this wonderful program funded by OSEL meets families where they are. And I hope that all of you will look on the website of Parent Center Hub, which is the, the Technical Assistance Center website, and look for where the Community Parent Resource Centers are. Parent Training and Information Centers are wonderful. But in, in the, yes, they are wonderful. And they also honor cultural diversity. But the Community Parent Resource Centers are particularly tasked with the cultural diversity. And I want to invite you to be a partner and to say one thing I love so much about Rudd Turnbull, among many things, is he and Lourdes have partnered in every proposal that she's written since probably the early 90s when the CPRCs were first funded. Was she ready to write a proposal to a federal agency? How does she learn to do that? She's a community organizer. Rudd knew how to do that, but Rudd did not know how to serve homeless families. And so by partnering, Rudd could support Lourdes in her proposal and Lourdes could support Rudd in knowing how to honor cultural diversity. In every one of your communities, there are leaders from diverse backgrounds who can be supported through the support you can provide and you can learn and be supported from them. And I challenge all of you to develop a partnership with programs who need more resources because they've not had a place at the table in so many circumstances. But on the next slide, uh, you will see my friend Sherilyn, um, who um, started out um, as a custodian at the Beach Center, the program where Rudd and I worked, and we were very concerned when she was at risk of losing her job because of a injury she had on the job that was creating a mobility challenge. Diane Pope, she was at the health department, Lawrence Health Department. She was very respectful to me. She treated me just like a, a normal person. And what made it her so special to us was be, because the, she genuinely cared and she liked her job. So, and she took extra time out. Even like she got off at five o'clock, she'd have to stay longer to make sure she taught me how to make sure I properly took care of Deja. And then at home, she'd call me to check on me to see if everything was fine. And, and she was real attentive to us. She'd make sure we got rides. She'd come pick us up or have someone else could pick us up. When she would explain things to me, she'd want to make sure that I had got it. 
And she would say, I'm not asking you to repeat yourself because I think you're stupid or anything. Sometimes you say it out loud, you grasp it more. And she was teaching me how to learn how to do that. And she just was just so caring to us. You know, she treated us like really like we was one of her family members. She introduced us to some of her family, her husband, and everything. And that was just really awesome because nobody, no staff person that uh, comes from that nursing, they strictly about their business, but she was strictly about our family and it staying together and making sure we are properly taken care of, and even myself. And it just wasn't just about Daisha, it was also about me. I was grateful for her. Well, when I would call a certain organization that was in our life also, and then I'm trying to explain to them I have a learning disability. Well, you need somebody in the family that could read it. They wasn't apt to help me. They didn't want to help me. They made me feel so less than, less than a person, less than a mother. And sometimes I felt like giving up. It just really made me feel like I was done. You know, and like I shouldn't have had a child because I needed a little more extra help from these people, you know. And I just kind of went with the motion. I, I just stopped contacting them. Well, we became allies with Sherilyn in supporting her in her case against the university and then becoming really lifelong friends. It's been about... I would say a 25 year friendship. And we have learned so much. Sherilyn's life is so much more challenged than ours. And we have learned so much from her as she shares, you know, what's going on and she shares her resilience. And I think she has benefited from us just as we have benefited from her because we've been able to be there for her in ways that had made a big difference. And um, what I want to say is we started that 25 years ago just to a demonstration of caring. It has developed into a long-term trusting partnership. And as Rudd and I celebrate our 150th birthday <laughs> and we recognize our mortality, you know, we are going back to Kansas tomorrow to grieve the death of a friend who's 80 years old. She, you know what Sherilyn tells us? She wants to take care of us when we're old. That we will never need to go to a health care center or a nursing home because she will always be there for us. That's what partnerships are for, and you have the opportunity to honor cultural diversity by finding those people in your own network where the reciprocity can be wonderful for everyone. So the next principle of partnership is commitment. And I've learned that the, the, in our focus groups, families talked about the professionals who were really instrumental for them, did things like going above and beyond, was very frequently mentioned. And we said, what do you mean going above and beyond? And they said, well, like when we see them at the grocery store, they say hello to us. I mean, it wasn't like huge amounts of time, but it was like being treated as a person that was really cared about. Um, one of the things that I learned in, since my retirement was um, I took the training to be a hospice volunteer. I thought, well, I need to prepare for my next transition. <laughs> you know, I'm from special ed and know about transition, so I better, I better learn what it's like to be in hospice. And this, was, this is a stand-in picture for, for Eleanor, who, with whom I was matched in hospice. And when I first went to see her, she was blind, almost deaf, had dementia, had leukemia, and I walk in wanting to be her friend and start asking her questions, and she can't even see me and hardly hear me. And I'm asking her questions, and she finally said, I'm sick of you asking me those questions. My life is none of your business. And I said, well, okay. Um, I said, um, 
Maybe you'd like to ask me some questions. Maybe you wonder who I am, and I'd be happy to tell you anything about myself. And she said, I don't care a thing about you. <laughs> that was our first meeting. <laughs> and it went down from there. <laughs> because on the second meeting I went, and she was in bed, and she needed to go to the bathroom, but she doesn't walk. She uses a wheelchair, and I didn't know how to move her from the bed to her wheelchair. And so I said, Eleanor, if you'll guide me, I'm happy to help you. Um, but um, just tell me what you want me to do. And she said, OK, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to drop dead. <laughs> well, after that, I mean, where do you go from there, you know? But I learned that she loved ice cream through one of our conversations. And so the next visit, I took two cups of ice cream, and, and we, the, the aides helped me get her in the chair, and I took her for a walk outside, and we ate our ice cream outside with the fall air. And that's all it took to bond. And I kept taking ice cream, but it didn't matter anymore, because we bonded over me going a little above and beyond. I had to get permission from the hospice program because we're not supposed to give anything or take anything to hospice patients. But it really reinforced what families had said in this research, that they love educators who will go above and beyond. And when you go above and beyond, you don't have to do it often. You know, but it just is a demonstration of I truly care about you. Equality is another principle of partnership. Um, and um, in a research study, I've got a reference list at the end of the presentation for any of the studies that I've mentioned. But in this study, we asked professionals, who is your favorite parent for a partnership and why? You know, what's an ideal partnership with a parent? And we call the results the Goldilocks principles because some, um, some of the educators would say, well, I hate it when families try to tell me what a new technique is or tell me a website I should check out. It's like they're trying to do my job. You know, they don't trust me to make decisions and it's not their role to give me information about strategies. So they didn't like families who gave too much, but they also really didn't like families who gave too little, who didn't show up, you know, who would miss appointments, who would not follow through. And so we said, well, what is just right involvement? And this is a typical quote, um, and this, um, this quote kind of starting in the middle, most of the parents I have have been really supportive in what ways were they good? Whatever modifications I came up with, they are very willing to help. And it was the sense they do when I ask them to do, but not a sense of we make the decision together about what's important to do. And so what we really need to think about with equality is not professionals having power over families and not families having power over professionals. But having power through partnerships and what we know from research and what we know from our experience is, and what we know from the planning of our son that Anita talked about when so many people came together to support Jay to have a life of dignity is that there is such synergy through committed, reliable allies and trusting partnerships you can accomplish the unimaginable. So then all of this leads to trust of using sound judgment, following through on our word and maintaining confidentiality. In one of the revisions of our family textbook, we use the, we use the metaphor of an um, uh, arch with each of the blocks of the arch being one of these principles, but trust being the keystone, trust being what holds it all together. 
So what I've just gone over with you, this is the principles of partnership, but now I'm going to highlight just briefly the types of partnership. So we go back to the sunshine, and we've covered that inner circle, and now we're going around and the meeting basic needs uh, well, let me go to, let's see, like three o'clock, okay? Referring and evaluating, and five o'clock, individualizing. Those are primarily the partnerships that come from IDEA. Also, at 11 o'clock, advocating for systems change. Those are the three kind of special ed type. The others are from the Epstein framework of the general education. Meeting basic needs, one o'clock. And then seven o'clock, extending learning to the home and community, volunteering and participating. If we want a framework for inclusive programs, then we have to bring together the general ed family partnership and the special ed family partnership. And to tell you the truth, one of the major differences is in the general education literature, the Joyce Epstein work, which is phenomenal, and many other people, they talk about the types of partnership, which are the points, but they don't talk about the principles of partnership, which is the communication and the competence and the respect and the equality and so forth. And that's what we've learned from special education, is that the partnerships have to be characterized by an affective dimension. It's not just what you do, but it's how you do it, how you interact. This is going to be the magic. And so, um, again, I want to say my vision is that families would be taught how to interact with professionals through a framework like this and professionals would be taught how to interact with families and that we're all kind of on the same page. So I'm just going to, for the sake of time, just hit a couple of these. What would we do without our triangles, you know? <laughs> so once again, what I want to say is all of those points that go out from the sun, the sun rays, they are all triangles. And each of those, like in meeting basic needs, there's a universal level and a, a group level and an individual level of each one of those. So the trusting partnerships for assessment for special education eligibility. We know that there's a disproportional number of African American students identified. We know this process is incredibly jargon laden and there's such a huge disconnection between all this time and money put into assessment and the little bit that comes out in terms of how you teach the child and the so what, as Rudd calls it, the so what question of that assessment. How do we improve that? Well, we can think about the tiered practice of the universal seeking information from families that assessment is not just the professionals, but we invite families to complete questionnaires and to share in parent-teacher conferences, send emails, send videos of what their child is doing at home. Small group, we can partner with Lourdes Pereira in Brooklyn or other staff from parent training and information centers and community parent resource centers to explain IDEA assessment requirements and research-based practices for assessment in native language. And individualized, we can conduct an ecological assessment of the student in the home and community environment with families as partners. So there, there, and those are just three examples for each of these levels. There could be a dozen ways that we could do this. Now remember, and this is the sunshine, that those principles of partnership get infused in every one of those types. So in assessment, in, eval in referring and evaluating, we infuse the principles. So every, pr it's not just we're carrying out our assessment duty, 
but we are, it's, this says, ask parents. Let me change that to encourage parents to share videos of skills the child is demonstrating at home. Competence, learn research-based assessment accommodations. Learn universal design for learning, for assessment. Respect, assess the child's strengths. And you can read the commitment and the equality and the trust. So in every type of partnership, we are going to infuse all six of those principles. Trusting partnerships for the IEP. Typically only mothers attend and typically have a passive participation. Parents often bemoan to each other how much they dread the conferences. The worst I've ever heard is the mother who was a cancer survivor and she said, I'd rather have chemotherapy again than go to my child's IEP conference. I thought, gosh, that is just tragic. Parents of color and with lower incomes being less likely to attend and be satisfied. And that we've not accomplished equal partnerships and there are wonderful sessions on the program of how to take the IEP to the next level. So with the tiered practices, again, at the universal level for IEPs, providing a structured way for parent input in advance of the conference. Encouraging fathers. I mean, there's research to demonstrate conferences last longer and they cover topics more thoroughly if, if a father is there. And other family members. Invite a parent from the Parent Training and Information Center to provide small group IEP training for the families who are particularly overwhelmed and uh, intimidated at the conference. The individualized, and this maybe is not just individualized, but small group and maybe someday universal IEP facili facilitated IEPs. And again, great sessions at this meeting. Again, we're going to infuse all six principles of partnership into the IEP partner, partners. So again, when there's so much potential for having a consistent way to go about doing partnerships. Um, I had, uh, I, we had the opportunity this morning to hear Ruth talking about comments for new directions. And I encourage you, if you think this is important, to submit comments about having a new technical assistance center on research to practice family partnership. Because family partnership is kind of spread across a lot of different centers, but it's not the focus of any centers. And if you, if you think partnerships is a, is a way to a more positive future, please take the time to encourage the um, a systematic, solidly funded center. And we have wonderful um, new early career family researchers and family trainers in universities, such as these two people at the table and uh, Tracy back here. There is a great cadre of of early career professionals who could just go to town with this framework and develop trainings and, and be partners with cadre and be partners with parent training and information centers in really bringing this to fruition. Some typical, some existing resources. Rudd and I have a family textbook. This is in the seventh edition now. We'll be starting the eighth edition and my dream is our eighth edition, eighth edition will be done in partnership with our early career family um, trainers and researchers and to really pass the baton to this wonderful group of people who will be able to so move ahead of what Rudd and I have been able to do. Um, there, um, OSEP uh, funded a center at the University of North Carolina to develop early childhood modules. Someone along the line of the IRIS Center that Ruth mentioned this morning. Here's a link to a family partnership module that I developed 
for the center that their videos, their uh, research-based practices, their policy guides, and all of this is free, as Ruth talked about, IRIS being free. And um, if you're especially interested in early childhood, I would encourage you to think about this. Um, Rudd and I have been doing some work with an online company in Raleigh, North Carolina called Relias, and they have a lot of online webinars that can be taken for CEU credits. This is a um, course on um, family partnerships, and I should know how many CEU credits you get for this, and I don't remember. But, um, and it doesn't cost that much. It seems like it costs maybe $25 or something like that to have access to the webinar and then to be able to get the CEU credit. And it's on the, uh, you know, the principles of partnership that we've talked about today. At the Beach Center that Ron and I co-directed at the University of Kansas, um, we have a tool that you can link to here that you can use for a self-assessment for uh, professionals can use as a self-assessment or an evaluation tool that families can use to indicate the extent of their satisfaction with their partnerships. This is a database way to see how things are going and to set goals for professional development. I want to close by highlighting my favorite school. Um, this is a school in uh, Los Angeles called WISH. It started as an elementary school and as a charter school, uh, started by parents of children with and without disabilities to do full and research-based inclusion. And the parents on both sides of the table, they weren't on different sides of the table, they were all at a round table, loved it so much that they, um, have developed a middle school, and this year they've started a high school. The parents of kids without disabilities said this can't stop. Our kids are benefiting so much from having the opportunity to celebrate and honor diversity. So in interviews with the parents, and I want to get back to the title now, Win, 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 and kind of wrap this up, that in terms of the win for the parents and interviewing them, it was so much fun because they would talk about before and after WISH. Every parent kind of framed it like that. And before their kids went to WISH, going to the IEP meeting was like going to fight. It was a super, super battle, always a struggle. After, you know, while attending WISH, they explained everything thoroughly. It was such a collaborative process. It is exceeding expectations. One dad who's an engineer told me, that he was so ready to fight and he had his, you know, his plan ready of where he was not going to negotiate, that he was totally disarmed in his first IEP conference at WISH that he didn't need to fight and, and that his plan could be tossed out the window because everybody was on the same page. A different, the parents use this phrase over and over, it's been like night and day. Their kid was the same, the parents were the same, the context was different. And the research findings from several studies, parents who have higher satisfaction with partnerships report having f higher family quality of life and lower family stress. Isn't that amazing? That, that you, that, that educators can contribute to families having a better quality of life through having a trusting partnership with them. That's big news. Now a win for teachers, I love this quote. Gosh, last year my kid was in Miss Casey's class and so they had an email out, oh we need this for birthdays of the month and I swear if it took more than 10 minutes to get back online, you are not gonna get on the list of stuff to contribute. It's crazy, but as far as community goes, I've never been to a school like this. Think what it's like for teachers in 10 minutes to issue a call, a need, and to have so much response that they have to cut off the rest of the people. That's reality at WISH. Now listen for students. A father said, 
there's this really real community that we feel, and I think when the parents are here, it sends a message to the kids about how much they are loved and how much they are cared for, and I think it helps them to develop that same sense of community with other students. Research from the National Transition Longitudinal Study has, has reported that students with more family involvement are less far behind in reading, have better grades, have higher rates of involvement in school organizations and with friends. Youth with more involved families are more likely to have regular paid jobs after school. Huge! And youth with disabilities whose parents expect them to go to post-secondary education and more positive engagement and achievement in high school. What can you believe that from doing those six principles of partnership through the six types of partnership that you can have that many benefits? It doesn't cost anything. This isn't, this isn't buying a whole new curriculum. This isn't building a new building. This isn't buying complicated technology. This is how we treat each other, human being to human being. And we can do all of that is within our capacity. After I visited WISH my first day and I'd conducted focus groups and, and interviews, and this was part of a project that Tina was the project officer on, the SWIFT project, and looking at excellent schools doing inclusion, and in this case also partnerships. And I wanted to convey it to Rudd, but I didn't have the words. You know, do you, sometimes it's something been so stupendous for you, so out of the ordinary, that you kind of can't put into words what you felt and what you saw. And so I said to Rudd, I called him in, back in Kansas, and I said, Rudd, this must be what Dr. King was talking about. And he said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, honestly, Rudd, I've been to the mountaintop today. I really, I mean, I have been working on family partnerships since 1973. I mean, I'm 70 years old, remember? I've been doing this a lot of years, and I had never seen it fully in practice. I had dreamed it. I had envisioned it. I'd seen pieces of it. And so many people have called me unrealistic, and that can't really happen, and good luck, Anne, and it'd be nice if the world worked that way. But I saw it, and I smelled it, and I tasted it from teachers and teacher aides and the principal and the parents and the students, and it was so wonderful. I said, this must have been what Dr. King felt. And so I want to close with Dr. King. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go to the mountain. I went to the mountain of wish. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land, and I saw the promised land of partnerships. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight, today, that uh, we as a people will get to the promised land. But I want to say something to you. I am going to get there with you because 70 is the new 40. <laughs> So let's go together to the promised land of partnership.